Over the past few years, artificial intelligence, or AI, has become an integral part of society. But that technology, the one that curates your Netflix or Facebook feeds, that tailors your LinkedIn job postings, that assists doctors in making medical decisions, is biased. And the best way to limit that bias is by increasing algorithmic literacy in kids. Not just a subset of kids, but kids of all genders, races, and backgrounds. Let's start by defining AI. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is any technology that mimics human behavior, like decision-making. AI consists of algorithms, which are specific sets of rules the AI learns by looking at patterns in the data, which is fed to the AI by the people who code it. To limit bias, AI algorithms should be trained on data and by programmers who represent the people these algorithms are supposed to serve. But currently, AI algorithms are trained by people and on data that represent a tiny subset of the population. And they're only mostly effective on that subset of the population. So when these algorithms are applied to the entire population, they can amplify the embedded biases of the limited data sets they were trained on, potentially resulting in inequity. AI is supposed to represent the best of humanity, objective, lightning fast, and exponentially scalable. But just like its creators, AI shaped by bias could be flawed too. Picture this. Shonda and Melinda are both in the process of buying a home. Shonda is an African-American female buying a home in a predominantly black neighborhood. Melinda is of European descent, and she's buying a home in a predominantly Caucasian neighborhood. Now, financially, both women are virtually the same. They have the same credit score, the same monthly income, and they're buying similarly priced homes. They're also applying for mortgages to help finance these future homes. Now, if an AI algorithm is used to automatically determine the interest rate both women will pay on their mortgages, it'll be trained on data that was previously used by humans in determining these interest rates. Data like both women's monthly income, their credit scores, the value of the homes that they're buying, the value of the future homes, and the area the homes are being bought in. Now, I told you earlier that financially, both women are exactly the same. So it would be reasonable to assume that they would also receive similar or even the same interest rates, right? Well, you'd be surprised. Shonda's quoted interest rate would be up to nine percentage points higher than Melinda's. This disparity costs black borrowers an extra $250 to $500 million annually. Clearly, this algorithm was biased against Shonda. But why? A UC Berkeley study suggested this disparity may be based on history. Applicants who buy homes in previously marginalized neighborhoods, like predominantly African-American neighborhoods, may receive higher interest rates because they're seen as higher-risk borrowers. This means that Shonda's home location actually served as a proxy for racial bias, exposing her to a higher interest rate for no other reason than the fact that in the past, moneylenders believed African Americans would be more likely to default on their home loans. But ironically, these higher interest rates mean higher monthly payments, which do make it more difficult for people living in these neighborhoods to meet their monthly payment obligations. And this threat extends beyond housing. Biased AI can perpetuate inequity in everything from discriminatory hiring algorithms to harsher prison sentences. And if the ethical repercussions of AI biases aren't enough to convince you of their gravity, maybe the impact on businesses will. AI biases could and often do cause businesses to lose millions of dollars in revenue. A few years ago, Amazon created an algorithm to decide which zip codes should and shouldn't get access to Prime. Now, Amazon trained the algorithm on factors like whether an, a zip code had enough warehouses, had enough subscribed Amazon customers, and had enough drivers willing to deliver to that area. 
So Amazon used these factors with the goal of maximizing their profitability. But instead, these factors resulted in the exclusion of predominantly African-American neighborhoods, neighborhoods that didn't have access to warehouses or delivery drivers. These data points also served as proxies for racial bias, in the process causing Amazon to lose entire zip codes of potential prime customers. Just think of how much money Amazon left on the table because of biased AI. AI is a double-edged sword. A single algorithm could both drastically improve or impair billions of outcomes. We must try to use it to create a more equitable future. But how? Well, let's return to the root of the problem. A lack of diversity in the AI workforce, the people who assemble the data sets and train the algorithms. Workforce diversity will include more perspectives, which means more people's needs will be addressed. People are more perceptive of their own problems. So the more people we have creating things, the more people's problems will be solved, reducing the possibility of bias. To illustrate this principle, let me tell you a story about a commonly used medical technology, pulse oximeters. Jasmine is an African-American woman in her mid-60s. In early 2021, she contracts COVID-19. She feels short of breath, so she goes to the emergency room where the doctors take her blood oxygen levels using a pulse oximeter. They find that her levels are in the mid-90s, which is above the healthy limit, so it's nothing to worry about. Her lungs are working fine, so they send her home. But a few hours later, Jasmine starts feeling dizzy. She starts getting confused, and she starts getting headaches all of which are telltale signs of life-threateningly low oxygen levels. She returns to the emergency room where the doctors now use a blood test instead of the oximeter. They find that her blood oxygen levels are in the low 80s, which is well below the lowest healthy limit. The doctors quickly give Jasmine supplementary oxygen, narrowly saving her life. But why did the oximeter return such an inaccurate reading on Jasmine, risking her life? It's all in how oximeters work. Pulse oximeters shine a light through the patient's skin to record light absorption by oxygenated versus deoxygenated red blood cells. But melanin also absorbs light, and darker skin patients have higher amounts of melanin in their skin. This means that pulse oximeters can alter readings in patients with darker skin, patients like Jasmine. In fact, industry standard pulse oximeters are three times more likely to misreport blood oxygen readings in African American patients than in white patients. Oximeters also have a gender bias, tending to misreport levels in women more often than in men. These oximeter biases mean that women and people of color are more likely to receive abnormally high oxygen readings leading doctors to believe that they don't need potentially life-saving supplementary oxygen. But why didn't anyone think to test oximeters on women and people of color during development? It's because the health tech industry, like the tech industry, is primarily trained on data from light-skinned males and by male programmers. Women and people of color are grossly underrepresented. We simply aren't present at the decision-making table to suggest that algorithms take into account our unique factors too. Workforce diversity also includes more different perspectives, which can allow us to think about problems in new ways, to rethink our hypotheses. I learned this in my own research when I realized a certain type of AI algorithm wasn't as well suited for neurological images as I'd originally thought. Because I'm still a beginner in the field, I'm just a teenager, I had less biases about what should and shouldn't happen, making it easier for my research group as a whole to come to this conclusion. Had all of us on the research team been the same age and from the same institution, it's possible no one would have suggested this possibility. So how do we get this workforce diversity? The obvious answers include increasing racially and geographically diverse recruiting, but I'd suggest a more unexpected solution. Start with the kids. Expose young girls and minorities to artificial intelligence when they're still young, before they have a chance to develop potentially harmful stereotypes about not being naturally good at STEM. 
As a girl and a person of color myself, for the longest time, I wasn't even considering a career in computer science. I just didn't see that as an option. We can't expect to assemble a diverse artificial intelligence workforce if women and people of color simply aren't studying artificial intelligence, if they lose interest in STEM in middle school. By understanding how the technology that shapes our world is created, I'm confident that kids who are still forming their career interests will have a greater incentive and conviction to shape the future of AI. Now, there are organizations worldwide working to greatly increase access to computer science education, but there is still no widely used artificial intelligence curriculum in elementary, middle, and high schools. I'm aiming to change that fact through my nonprofit, AI Inspire, which has so far served 26,000 students in 91 countries. And as a youth-led team, we hope to serve as an example to inspire other young kids to look at us and think, hey, if they can do this, maybe we can too. You can help this mission by encouraging the kids in your life to explore the magic of AI, whether that's through hands-on workshops, insightful discussions, or exposure to new topics in the field. With its limitless scalability, AI's greatest asset is simultaneously its greatest danger. AI is only as unbiased as the people who train it. So let's commit to creating AI for a more inclusive world. If we follow this path, together we can harness AI's infinite scalability to truly serve everyone for good. Thank you.